was that silent night when the stars turned their gaze to marvel at the earth. When the heavens gathered breathless round a lowly stable. When a young mother wept tears of worship, falling on the baby in her arms. And the song of the earth arose in Bethlehem, soft as the tender beating of his heart. And all was calm, all was bright. Yet could this be the same God of Abraham, the conqueror of Israel, this baby? This fragile life. He is Jesus. The one who thunders through the heavens, yet whispers to our hearts. Who reigns victorious, yet bows to serve the broken. My microphone. There we go. Good morning. <laughs> it is so awesome to see you all out there. Um, I'm wearing purple um, because it is Advent, the first week of Advent. And the cool thing is, this is what our church is about, right? Um, Nan Hubble made this. And she made it in the proper color because this is the, the season of purple for us. So if you were in the traditional worship service, you'd see me wearing my robe with the stole and the stole would be purple. You'd see the things on the altar communion table would be purple. And she made this for me. And what I know is that thousands of these things have been made by people like you and people like you that are watching online because Jacqueline would have me pick up fabric at her house and I would drop it off at other people's homes and it was just fabric and then I'd go back to the houses and it'd be filled with plastic bags of masks that had been made. Do we not have the Christmas spirit at Anona? It is just awesome. And wasn't that band piece incredible? Good stuff. I, I wanna talk today ab about this. I, what would it be like if, if you could actually have an encounter with God? There could be something that you could do, some place you could go, that you could have a moment in time where it's like, I'd have the opportunity, maybe just possibly, if I just did a few things to, to maybe have an encounter with the God who created all things. And to realize that that could be a possibility. And we're gonna be looking at a story in today's scripture where, where that happens. It happens to John the Baptist's parent his dad, Zachariah. And Zachariah and Elizabeth, they, they've been having this, this horrible time. She's been wanting to get pregnant, hasn't been able to get pregnant. And our scripture today is sort of gonna jump right into that story. And it's only in Luke's gospel. Out of all the other gospels, John the Baptist gets mentioned in all of the gospels, but it's only in Luke's gospel that we hear about the birth story surrounding John the Baptist and his parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. So we're reading the very first chapter of Luke, beginning at verse five, and here's what it says. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on in years. Once, when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside and then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you will name him John. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. I love that story. But what we may not know is, is 
is the story right before the story. Because with one page turn in our Bible, with just one turn of the page, you go from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You go from the book of Malachi to the book of Matthew. You go from the book of Malachi into the story of, of Jesus, of his birth in Matthew and Luke. And today as we read out of Luke's gospel, that turn of a page, this moment that, that, that Zachariah is experiencing, that distance between Malachi and the moment where the angel appears to John the Baptist, that's not 100 years. That's not 200 years. That's not 300 years. It's 400 years. And in the course of that 400 years, from, from a national perspective, from the perspective of the Israelites, there's been no prophets. There's been no word from God. And it's almost as if from their perspective, God is silent. And then you have this moment and all of a sudden 400 years of silence is gone. And I can picture Zechariah, I can picture all the feelings that he's going through in this moment as he's wrestling with, with, with the situation with his wife. He's getting up there in age and he has this moment where every year his, his, his troop of, of priests goes in to be able to have an opportunity to be able to serve at the temple, the temple. And they're all gathered together and every day that they're there, they cast the lots, they cast the lots, they cast the lots. And every time they're casting the lots, he's like letting, let it be me. Let it be me. Let it be me. And as he goes on through the years, year after year after year, because only one time are you allowed to, even if you get the lots cast and it's for you, only one time in your life will you have the opportunity to do what John, I'm sorry, what Zachariah did get to go inside the temple. And suddenly in this moment, on this day, after years of faithfulness, after years of praying, he's finally the one that when the lots get cast, he gets to go inside the temple. And I can picture what he's thinking. Like, this, this is what Moses did. This is, this is, Moses got to actually have moments where he had an opportunity to connect with God, to talk to God, to be with God one-on-one, -on -one, and I have an opportunity to do that. Moses, who stood before the burning bush and had an encounter with God. Moses, who went up on Mount Sinai and had an encounter with God. Moses, who, who got the instructions for the tabernacle, the thing that models the very temple that I'm about to go in, the tent that they used to move around all over the place as they were journeying from Egypt to the promised land. He would go inside that tent and he would come out and his face would be glowing and shining so much so that he'd have to wear a veil. And I, I get to go. I get to go inside the temple. I get to take that step. And I can imagine that as he goes through and he steps into that room, he sees the room for the first time, the thing that he's been taught about, the thing that he's taught others about, the things that he's imagined, what it would look like when he saw it, he now gets to see it. And over on his left, there's, there's this beautiful candelabra, seven oil lamps on top of it. And it's lit and it's, it's made out of gold. And it's gold that came from the time of Moses. That, 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 that piece of art was made from gold that as the Israelites left out of Egypt and they departed, the people of Egypt gave them gold to do it. If you remember that story. Take our rings, take our, our jewelry and they gave it to them and they ended up making, one of the things they made was that light. And over on his right, there's a table. And on this table is, is 12 loaves of bread. They're stacked six and six and it's called the show bread, the shoe bread table. And it represents the 12 tribes of Israel that came, guess where? Out of Egypt and journeyed across the desert into the promised land. And the bread signifying the provision of God that, that, that God is providing for Israel. So it makes you think of the manna that fell from heaven that fed them as they made that journey. And then he looks straight ahead of him and he sees the table, the place where he's supposed to serve today the altar of incense. And he's carrying out of the, 
the place where they'd sacrificed animals out here. He's carrying coals that are going to go in here with, with frankincense. He's going to pour that onto this altar of incense. And right behind the altar of incense, there's a curtain. And he's in a room that's called the holy place. And on the other side, it's called the holy of holies. And on the holy, holy side, that's where the Ark of the Covenant is. And he's over here and he puts those coals into the altar of incense. And the smoke starts to rise. And the smoke signifies the prayers, not just his prayers, but the prayers of all those people that are outside behind him outside the temple, people that will never have an opportunity to step inside. All of their prayers going up and it goes over that curtain, over to God. And sometimes people outside might be able to smell the offering that he's making. And it's in that moment that he notices that angel standing there to the right, standing there to the right of the altar of incense and he receives that word. Here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that we need that word. It's 2020. And a lot of us are thinking, like next year, 2021, we'll be so thankful 2020 is gone, right? You think it's like everything will get better, and we don't know that it will. But here's what I think we're looking like right now. It's what I feel like sometimes in here. I go walk in my neighborhood. I go driving around. How many of you know you could drive around and you look at Christmas lights? And you look at the Christmas lights and at night how beautiful they are. And then you go walking during the day. And if you've seen those little balloon blow up things that light up, and during the day when they don't have them blown up and lit up, it's like looking at the difference between a grape and a raisin. Right, you're looking at it, it's like, that is not Christmas at all. It's just like a, a lump of nothing. And I think that sometimes maybe in the course of this year, you have felt this, I have felt this, you feel like that. And what we need is a moment like this to, to be able to blow us up, to fill us in a way that, that causes us to know and to, to feel and to experience God in our lives. There's a Celtic saying that goes something like this. Heaven and earth are only three feet apart, but in thin places, it's even closer. Eric Weiner was writing about that. He, he'd heard that, that quote. And as he was looking at it, he's like, he started talking about the thin places and how a thin place is a locale, a location where, where heaven and earth somehow, some way come together. And you look at it and it's like it collapses together and sort of becomes one. And when, when Zechariah went into the temple, when the people would gather outside at the temple, that's what they were doing. They were coming to, to, a, to what they thought would be a thin place, a place where they could encounter God. And today, today those thin places in our tradition are called the church. And we've spent eight months, over eight months now, not 400 years, thank God, but eight months unable to come in this room until today. And the reason you're here, the reason you're here is because you want a piece of what Zachariah got. You want to have a word from God that speaks to your hearts, that fills you up, that blows you up with God's spirit in such a way that you're like, this is the way it's supposed to be. And it is the way it's supposed to be. Go all the way back to Genesis and you think of Adam and Eve walking with God in the garden. That's the way it is supposed to be to be and somehow some way it's not just about places what if it's also about specific times what if what if yes there's thin places where maybe there's a better opportunity to be able to connect with God but there's also better times wouldn't Christmas 
Wouldn't the Christmas season, Advent, wouldn't that be one of the best times, the thinnest times for us to be able to connect with God? Why do you, why do you think, I, I was like, why, why does the church fill up at Christmas? And I think it's because of that. I think it's because in our heart of hearts, there's the Adam and Eve feeling inside of each one of us that's like, I want that connection with God and I want the intimacy with, with, with others. I want both. And somehow, some way, every single Christmas season, you see it. You see just a little bit of the thinness develop. Because what happens during Christmas time, it's not just about the presents. It's about seeing people's faces and realizing that when you're looking at their faces, you're seeing more smiles at this time of year. You're seeing more joy. We talk about the Advent wreath, right? The Advent wreath with one thing lit. Peace, hope, love, joy, all wrapped up into one. That's what we see during the Christmas season. It's the season where where we become more generous. We start pouring out more. We literally start becoming the way we're supposed to be. And then as soon as the season passes, a lot of times it ends. And suddenly we're back on the road with horns honking, fingers flipping, language spewing, all stuff that just sort of evaporates because we're not singing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. The thing with, with Zechariah, <clears throat> this wasn't even really a special time. It doesn't say it was even a Sabbath day. It just says he was in the temple doing his duty on a day. Every day, though, he would be there when he needed to be there. Every day, I can imagine him getting on his knees. I can imagine him with his wife Elizabeth. I can imagine them holding hands together, praying and praying and praying. They're praying now because they're older. They're having to pray for something like what happened with Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament. They're praying for that child and finally the lots get cast and that moment comes and it actually happens for them. He was in the right place. He was doing the right thing at the right time. And it's those three things coming together that matter. We have to have the thin place. We have to have the thin time. But guys, we have to also have a thinning action. And I'm not talking about a diet. How many of y'all have ever seen a falling star? Right, you look, you suddenly, whoop, there's a, a falling star in front of you. I was out walking my dog, doing what dogs do. I had to stop, pull a bag out of my pocket, and bend down to pick up this wonderful gift that my dog left. And when I stood up and I'm tying it, I looked up and there it was, a falling star. I want you to think about this for a moment. That can happen. That can happen to any one of us. But what would you have to do in order to increase your chances, your odds, of being able to see a shooting or a falling star? You have to be looking. Now, here's the thing. That's not all you have to do. Because what if there's specific times in the year where you increase your chances of seeing a shooting star? What if one's coming up in December? What if a thing called the Geminid meteor shower is about to hit? What if in August you went out and you saw the Perseid meteor shower. You would take the moment. You'd say, what's the right place? Well, the right place is outside. So I would need to go outside in order to have that thin place to see that shooting star. I would have to think about the thinning time. And if I really want to have a better chance of having that moment to see that star, I'm going to have to do it during one of those meter showers. But you're still missing one thing. You have to take the action. You have to take the step. Guys, if you want an encounter with God, if you want to have the possibility 
for an encounter with God. You've got to do all three. You need to put yourself in thin places. You need to be thinking about thin times. And maybe you make your own thin time and you have a devotional time in the morning and that's your time every day or it's in the evening before you lay down to go to sleep. And then you have to do it. You have to actually act on it and take the step of saying, I'm going to live that out. John Wesley talked about it from this perspective. He called it means of grace. That somehow you can take an ordinary thing like prayer or, or going to church or scripture reading or fasting. There's different things you can do that don't guarantee that encounter with God, but they absolutely put, absolutely put you in a better place for that possibility to happen. Here's what I believe. I believe that, that God wants us to have those moments. In a time at Christmas when the world wants us to speed up, the world wants us to get more busy, to get more consumed, God is calling us to thin down and maybe start noticing where God is moving around you. Maybe start noticing where God is moving in you. And then maybe taking the step of saying, I want to see more. I want to experience more. And so I'm going to take that first step this Christmas season. God wants relationship with you with every single one of you. It's not a question of whether God is moving. It is a question of whether we're looking for God to move. Let's pray. God, we want to see. We want to have moments where where we encounter you, where we experience the things that are symbolized in that candle off to my right. Peace, hope, love, and joy. And to realize that at the center of it all is your son, your son that came into the world to show us how much you want relationship with us. You came to be with us face to face. Help us, God, not to forget. Help us, God, to look for and maybe even see you move. Grant us that grace, we pray, as we seek to approach your holy altar. We pray this, God, in the name of Jesus the Christ, the one that we especially celebrate this season. And we all say, Amen. Eric Weiner asked this question in the article when he was talking about thin places. Why isn't the whole world a thin place? And then he answered it. Maybe it is, but we're too thick to get it and to recognize it. God created the galaxies, but God also knows, knows the numbers of the hairs on your head. God is concerned. God is concerned with with falling stars. God is concerned with falling sparrows. And God is concerned for you. A fallen, hurting, lonely, isolated you. Maybe the world's thinner than we think. My prayer is that this is the thinnest Christmas 
you'll ever have. Amen. Amen.